This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 659, recorded on September 2nd, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Uh, it's 75 degrees Fahrenheit, um, kind of overcast and very humid. Very humid today here in New Jersey. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Hi, Vincent. Hi, Brianne. It's uh, 82. Wow. Overcast, muggy. Headed for 94, and they're promising rain, but uh, they've been promising that for a while, so um, I'm not totally counting on it. We need it. Our guest today is coming back for a second time on TWIV. He is the director of the Institute of Virology at Charité Hospital Berlin, Christian Drosten. Welcome back, Christian. Hi. I'm glad to see you're still uh, healthy and thriving. Well, <laughs> there's not much infection around currently in Germany. So we had a quiet summer. That's great. So that's actually our first question. So it's currently uh, quiet. There, there are no cases or are there are very few in Germany at the moment. Yeah, so there there is a low incidence. We have uh, like uh, between a thousand and thousand five hundred cases reported per day mm -hmm. uh, since I would say two months, uh, and it was even lower before that. Um, so we had this this early lockdown, right? Detected based on mainly diagnostics, um, then an early rather mild lockdown. Um, and uh, it seems that this has led to a situation where um, incidence was stable in a, in a very low area. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, well, it, it seems now, maybe like since a month, that incidence is, is slowly recovering, but we don't actually understand um, to, to the entirety what, where this, how this comes about. Because um, about a, a month ago, um, intense testing of uh, returning travelers was introduced at airports. And uh, I think a lot of the recent increase of incidents is based on that. And of course, here you catch people coming in um, who, have or, who are already recovering, basically, who, are, who have uh, who went through their infection while on vacation. Um, and while you get PCR positive results into the country, to, don't necessarily get infections into the country to a large degree. Uh, so the source clusters are still um, at the site of vacation and they remain there. So that could be an effect and that could also be an explanation while, uh, why very recently it looks like the incidence is even going down again a little bit um, because vacation season is, uh, is coming to an end mm -hmm. in most federal states now. Uh, I'm curious about the testing in the, in the airports. Uh, do, do you like uh, take samples and send them out and then contact people if necessary down the road? You don't get an answer at the point of care, right? Uh, no. Uh, well, the, the situation is a bit mixed uh, because the, uh, the way it's organized is, is a bit mixed um, based on, on how it's done locally. Um, but the usual setting is that there is a team of people taking swaps. The sample goes um, to some central lab um, and the, re the, the, the result is usually returned after 24 hours or somewhat longer. So that seems to be the normal uh, situation. But it is very difficult to maintain this. Um, so the testing cap capacity is really overstretched by this whole activity and, and labs are complaining um, that actually the capacity for normal uh, patient care uh, will will be exhausted. And, and as schools restart now, um, a lot of the argument ar around schools, of course, um, used um, the, let's say, the back door that at least we can test, right? Um, but we can't test if we continue to, to test at 
the efforts. So this somehow has to, well, one has to cancel the other, I, I guess. Mm. So you mentioned that there had been a mild lockdown or mild shutdown earlier. Yeah. Um, what types of things uh, happen? What would you sort of consider that mild shutdown to be for comparison? <laughs> Well, you could always go out for a run. You could always go to, to a grocery store. Um, it was not like you had police patrolling and, and looking at your ID card or, or your slip that permits you to go outside. So it's not like this type of lockdown. And many businesses were still open. And actually, it was a rather short lockdown. It was uh, like um, five weeks plus uh, two weeks of Easter holidays. Um, so not like three months strict lockdown without anybody uh, able to, to to even do outside sports. Um, this hasn't happened in Germany. Okay. Has there been masking from the from the beginning? Uh, pardon, I didn't get that. Have people worn face masks from ah, the beginning? No, no. no. Um, the situation was like uh, we didn't have enough supply. Um, we we just we had just enough supply for the medical system for hospitals, and we kept it for that. Um, and somehow at that time, of course, there wasn't um, sufficient scientific evidence for masks in the community. This seems to have changed now. Um, and we are now in a situation where we propose um, wearing of community masks basically in every inside situation um, and where nobody actually wears masks outside. Um, mm. And we have enough supply for, for the medical system. So the medical system wears proper surgical masks or even FFP2 masks while um, the normal people in the, uh, in the let's say, in, uh, on the, in buildings, they wear community masks. And what other restrictions are in place or are there? Can are restaurants open theaters, sporting events and all that? Yeah, well, the the problem here is that Germany is actually sixteen different uh, countries. It's uh, it's uh, well, it's federal states, not countries, but sometimes you think it's countries. Um, so regulations can vary um, and can differ. So th this this means like you you can have in some federal states um, an assembly of people, like an uh, official assembly inside. Uh, with up to 200 participants. In others, it's like up to 30. Um, and, and it continues like this. But in general, businesses are open. Um, all shops are open. Um, there are special situations that are restricted, like cultural events in the, on, on the inside, um, like the typical things like choirs, uh, they are really restricted. Um, and of course, like in, in, in all other countries, we have this school discussion uh, and we are, in fact, uh, opening schools entirely in, uh, in all federal states. Um, and there is not really something like um, a game-changing regulation uh, that you, for, for example, could, could see in Scandinavian countries where you say most of the classes have to take place outside and there there really has to be a, a big distance bet between students and so on this this is not really in place so actually we are going back into a mode where students wear face masks while they are um, outside the classroom in inside the building um, in, in some federal states most actually they can take off their mask once they are in the classroom um, there is not something like special distance um, uh, installed uh, based on moving the, the tables out, outside or something. It's also not that um, uh, there is special technical solutions uh, regarding ventilation. It's more like open the window if you can. Um, so that's the situation. And uh, of course we have this low incidence in the population and this of course probably is the reason why in, uh, in several federal states where schools are open now for about two weeks, um, we see single introductions into schools, but not really outbreaks. There, is, there are some outbreaks, some situations that have been reported. Um, it, it also seems like not all outbreaks are being reported in the public. Um, this, 
this is also because of the federal system. Actually, the responsibility for public health is with the federal states. Um, this makes the uh, central reporting a bit slow. Hmm. Um, but overall, it doesn't seem like we have a major problem as of now. Um, some people think this is because schools are just uh, not a hazard uh, and uh, children are not really involved in this whole thing. Um, others, including me, think um, this is because of the low background incidence overall. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm puzzled because it sounds like uh, generally from what you describe, uh, you have had uh, a much lighter caseload overall, it seems to me, yes. uh, during this whole thing relative to the situation, for example, here in the U.S., but I don't hear anything you're saying. It sounds like there was something dramatic done uh, uh, initially or or ongoing that accounts uh, really for the difference, except that maybe you, uh, uh, you know, what you say about mm, the overall incidence or caseload being low, maybe getting on top of it initially yeah. uh, kept that low. And maybe once you reach a sort of a critical mass, things get out of control fast. Did you ever have a situation anywhere in Germany where the healthcare system was overwhelmed, where there was a, a huge problem? Yeah, there is some, uh, let's say, gradient in Germany. So um, in, in the southwest, um, there were many more um, initial importations, uh, mainly from Italy. And this uh, has remained the, the high incidence area up to this day. Um, so even now in a low incidence situation, you can make this, you can perceive this difference that the incidence is in the Southwest. Um, and um, it is interesting to compare against Spain and France, two countries with very similar populations, actually structure and uh, I don't know what population size. Um, the, the big difference there is that Spain and um, France detected their outbreaks based on cases, on clinical cases, uh, while Germany detected their outbreak based on diagnoses, PCRs. Uh, so we had this, let's say, um, stealth PCR testing along with influenza screening in place um, er, in, in, let's say, middle of February. Oh, and wow. I, I remember exactly the first two cases were imported from Italy and then the secondary case to that. And then the third case was already um, a local transmission um, out of nowhere, detected based on influenza, let's say, by catch. Um, mm. And this continued. So we, within very short time, we were aware there is exponential growth based on exponential growth of positive PCR results. And this somehow coincided with the time when the Bergamo outbreak in Italy happened and when you saw the problems there on television. And um, I'm, I think I mentioned this in the first uh, podcast that I joined. You have this, these two criteria for politicians. One is um, TV pictures in Italy or in other countries. The other is it's already here. Right. And it doesn't matter whether this information is based on cases or diagnoses. And this is what caused Germany to uh, to go into lockdown effectively a month earlier than the neighboring countries only because, uh, well, it's uh, it's the, the relative time of detection. And I think we are benefiting from this up to this day. Right. And we are um, well, we see the same um developments in society uh, we we see um, anti uh, we see people who who oppose the whole thing and we who stop to believe in, uh, in the existence of the virus um, so we are we are more and more light-footed um, and I'm I'm not sure sure how this this will continue for Germany. And the, um, when this, you do your testing, um, are you doing testing of asymptomatic individuals or or people who are symptomatic? Well, up to now, or let's say up to the introduction of the traveler screening about a month ago, um, most of the testing was symptoms-based and then based on contact tracing, right? So um, this in reality causes most um, uh, indications for PCR to be symptoms-based. 
Uh, this has changed a bit now with the traveler screening, but I think we have to switch back. Um, uh, not only for reasons of, let's say, epidemiological considerations, but also because of the shortening of supply of PCR reagents. Um, so we are um, working with the same PCR reagents that many other countries uh, work with. So there is competition. Um, there, there are de facto trade restrictions. They are not official, but it's, uh, well, this is just a matter of how full stocks are, and they are uh, more and more exhausted over here. Is there any role for um, testing in the school reopening there? Not systematically. It's, mm -hmm. uh, well, actually, there is some um, test strategies. They can vary. Um, there are local studies and small-scale solutions testing teachers on a regular basis, mm -hmm. um, testing students on a, on a pooled sample basis. But actually, none of this has really been transformed into regulations, and there is no systematic surveillance based on, on PCR. As you probably know, uh, Michael Minna here at uh, Harvard mm -hmm. has advocated inexpensive, rapid uh, saliva-based antigen tests on an almost daily basis uh, to, to deal with the school situation. And we're not there yet, but th hopefully we will be. What, do you have uh, any opinion of that? Is there any role for that in Germany? Well, it would be nice to have, um, but I think there are, there are many realities here. So, uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a clinical virologist. I really do diagnostics. Um, so I'm a bit skeptic about um, the, this coincidence of having um, a mass, a bulk test um, based on an antigen testing format um, and combining this resulting low sensitivity with saliva testing. Because if, if you look at saliva, not only in the first week of symptoms in, in a clinical cohort, but if you just look at viral load, you will see that saliva contains considerably less um, virus. Um, so it's not the best sample. I think, uh, I think an antigen test should be con combined with a proper swab because it just contains more virus. Um, and you need to go for, for ways to improve the sensitivity of antigen tests. So this is the, the plain lateral diffusion anti mm -hmm. antigen tests. Um, I think all the other formats around, including this LAMP, CRISPR combination and so on, um, this is nice technology, but somebody has to obtain a license on it uh, before the pandemic is over. Um, and this is not likely to happen, at least not in Germany. So I, what I see is, uh, is the simple antigen tests that have a sensitivity cutoff between let's say threshold cycle 25 and 30 in, in real-time PCR, that's about where the cutoff of these antigen tests is. Mm -hmm. um, these may be, let's say, cleared by authorities before Christmas. So they can be used at least in the hand of medical professionals. That's the, the situation in Germany. Um, I know there are some commercial products coming, coming up, um, including in Europe. But again, the, the question is, supply. So is this uh, just a nice uh, product for, for having a, a trial kit or can you get 10 million of these strips per month? So you will have, you will have them swimming in ditches in the street, used strips instead of the <laughs> used masks that are now swimming in the ditches, right? <laughs> well, uh, Abbott recently came out with a Relatively rapid test, uh, lateral flow, five dollars U.S. They claim they can make fifty million a month eventually within a few months, and uh, 3M is also making paper strips. And so there's a yeah. big push here to really get those in everyone's hands. Yeah. So well, the well, Abbott, the the Abbott, the Abbott test. Um, going back to your comments about uh, saliva versus uh, a nasal swab, the Abbott test uses. Uh, if I understand it correctly, a, a regular nasal swab, not a nasal pharyngeal swab, which is uh, more easier to do and more tolerable. Um, do you have any, from your clinical virology perspective, do you have any uh, perspective on the difference between saliva, a nasal swab, and a nasal pharyngeal swab? 
Well, these anterior nasal swabs, we haven't really tested them. Okay. Um, so for the, let's say, nasopharyngeal versus oropharyngeal, um, it seems there is like a half a lock advantage for, for the nasopharyngeal. But it seems to count that you have some cells sticking on the, on the swab. Well, okay. they come from the nose or the throat. Well, mm. okay. Uh, Christian, um, in your opinion, do children transmit infection? Uh, I think there is proof. The, the question is how relatively efficient they do this. Um, I think the, the viral load data that are coming together now um, show that the viral load is just the same. It's, it's really equal. Um, I'm not sure whether the sus susceptibility of children is really lower based on this, let's say, 10% difference of ACE2 expression. I'm a bit skeptical about that. Um, and I... Uh, th there are other other considerations like they exhale less volume because of the smaller lungs and so on but this this has to be discounted against the 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 behavior right they won't respect uh, let's say distance rules and so, <laughs> and so on <laughs> so my my son is 3 <laughs> horrible in this regard <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah I, I can't really tell. I think we have to wait for a month. Um, and I think there is mm -hmm. a lot of evidence already that there is considerable rates of transmission, especially in, uh, let's say, in educational settings, even, even in care settings with, with younger children. I think this, this is going to become difficult. Yeah, so yeah, it would yeah. be interesting to be able to compare um, the... Uh, oh, well, let me ask you this. Is there any data in Germany on uh, seropositivity in the population? Uh, yeah, we, we have data. Um, these data are um, a bit um, different in their, in their conception. So we have studies that went into um, sites of outbreaks and they, they just looked for seroconversion rates there. Um, and this results in, let's say, Six to six to ten percent rates of uh, of antibody prevalence after um, a reported and heavy outbreak in a small okay. and, and there are some examples of small communities uh, studies like this. Um, I'm aware of um, of interim data from um, population wide surveys and the antibody rates there seem to be below 1%. If you look at re reliable antibody readouts, including confirmation by neutralization tests and so on. Because, you know, in the moment, having, uh, you know, historically or in the present moment, having very few cases around is great. Mm -hmm. uh, but my sense is that this virus is not going away, okay? No. Uh, absent, absent a vaccine, okay? And so when, when uh, uh, people boast that they've kept it back i'm thinking well what about tomorrow okay yes. Uh, yes. because you may have in fact a more susceptible uh, uh population are you uh, how do you feel about that well the hope is to to have a vaccine right. uh, at least for the high risk groups early and then of course at some point um maybe a decision to to then accept more infections this is uh, i think the the concept it, it has to be the concept i think it's uh, it's not realistic to assume that we can keep the the incidence low until the day when we introduce the vaccine and then just vaccinate the whole population and the problem is solved this is not how it's going to work and of course there are interesting phenomena especially if you consider a low inf incidence situation like ours um there's a very nice nice paper, this one. I discussed this in the German podcast yesterday. Can mm. you read? This? Yeah. The abundance threshold for plague as a critical percolation phenomenon. Exactly. So this is a very nice nature paper by and I know one of the authors, Heavy Leas, um and uh, uh, and w uh, one of the, the others. Um uh, so actually I know two authors here. And um 
So I, I've known this paper by heart and I remembered it somehow. Um, and while making up my mind about this difficult situation now with, with um, low prevalence going slightly up and then down again, and nobody really understands what's going on while in Spain and France, um, there now seems to be an exponential increase mm -hmm. again. Um, I'm... I'm actually considering whether this percolation theory should be considered more for Germany. So um, in, in simple words, this is like um, you have edges in a network and they are not properly connected. And only once they are connected by the presence of some mass of infection overall, um, you have an accessible metapopulation through which a virus can then spread. Mm. Um, and before that, The network is not closed. It's not available. Um, and it, it's possible that we are in this situation in Germany. So our, we have these outbreaks, um, detected and non-detected mixture, um, and it's not really taking off. Um, and of course, the question is, considering, let's say, the US w with a purported 14% seroprevalence, right? Is, well, is that the right? Well, no, I mean, it depends uh, where you look. It is in Texas. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. It, but okay, if you uh, look in Washington, uh, Washington State, it's about 1%, one, one, 2%. It really yes, depends. That's, oh, okay. that's correct. Okay. It, okay. it varies. So, but, but let's consider Texas, right? Okay. Let's, let's um, put Texas in, in a lockdown, And bring Texas in a low back into a low incidence situation again. Will their threshold for going back into into high incidence, into exponential amplification, be much higher based on the percolation effect that you have in a low incidence situation? This is an interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a, a modeler. Right, um, people like like Mark, Mark Lipsic could probably answer this, um, but I well, this is not my uh, my my subject. But I find this a very interesting thought, um, and yeah, I'm I'm I agree that uh, such a low population prevalence now going into into winter, um, yeah, it is also a worrisome. Thing, yes, and, we and don't when, know what's. Uh, for for instance, I'm I'm a bit worried sometimes when I consider Argentine, Argentina. Um, their population structure is is also quite European, mm -hmm. um, and if I understood correctly, they went into a lockdown after they they got first imported cases in a quite similar timing um, compared to European countries. So they, they had their first cases beginning of March and the, they went into a lockdown end of March um, and they maintained this lockdown almost for four or five months. Um, they are now opening up a bit. And overall this time, their incidence increased and increased. And um, especially in the, in the Buenos Aires uh, region, which is a big urban area. And, The main difference there is that they are in winter. Um, and that's really a worrisome thought for me because we are going into winter. Um, Germany is also quite urban in, in some areas. Um, and yeah, we are somehow, we may be a little bit too, too relaxed about the whole thing. So you worry about winter because people remain indoors more? Yeah, it's a combination, right? It's people remaining indoors, then this whole um, aerosol phenomenon indoors, uh, but also the cold noses of people outside, right? Um, I think there is some evidence that the virus replicates better in, uh, in more complex tissue models when you cool the incubator down uh, to like 34 degrees or something, and that's your nose in winter. It's always cold. <laughs> So you mentioned um, the idea of um, what will happen when we have a vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, what is um, going on with vaccines in Germany um, in terms of which vaccines you're looking at or which vaccines may be approved or available at some point in Germany? Well, I mean, this is uh, it is similar um, as with uh, with the situation in, in other countries. We are making contracts um, 
we are entering um, or organizing first steps to also maybe participate in larger phase three trials. Um, we have uh, projects here where, where um, vaccines are being developed. We have uh, basically two different types of RNA um, vaccines from Germany. Um, there is um, uh, one vector-based vaccine, an MVA-based uh, vaccine um, that goes into phase one now, just the next few weeks. Um, it's, it's ready, and, and this has been quite successful for other uh, targets, including MERS. Um, and, uh, well, we have the same expectation. We, we don't expect a, a vaccine before the U.S. Uh, elections. Um, <laughs> 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 well, we expect a, a vaccine before the next German elections, which will be autumn next year. <laughs> so so uh, I, I'm curious about the MVA vaccine. Uh, if you know any uh, details, is it just spike or does it have other antigens in it as well? No, spike. This is a spike-based okay. vaccine. All right. So, in fact, most of them are spike-based, as uh, you know, and we always worry about that. It's a an assumption that that's all you need, right? Well... Maybe that's all you need to protect the lung, but you will still have some replication in the nose. And um, again, a lot of discussion in the public about what this means, if this is still transmissible and so on. I see this coming. So, uh, you know, here in the U.S., we have more cases than anybody else. What did we well, do? I don't think so. Uh, but you are aware of more cases than anybody else. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Test uh, the test results more so. Right. You're absolutely right. So, what did we do wrong? I, I think um, you, you are not doing well. I, I mean, one could, of course, propose things that are not very popular, like you should go into another nationwide lockdown and then cool down a bit and then start over. But <laughs> hmm. I, I don't think this is, this is real. Um, and I think there, is, there, there are things, of course, to, um, to pity, which is that the, the initial um, chance to discover the outbreak early based on diagnostics um, wasn't really taken mm -hmm. and used. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm a bit surprised about... Um, how things went in Germany and how this still pays off, right? This yeah. is, yeah. Um, and you could have been in the same position in the U.S., definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is going to keep uh, epidemiologists busy for decades yeah. uh, after this with all the data from different countries. It's fascinating. Yeah. I, I exactly. mean, as, as you mentioned, in the U.S., we've had a lot of um, denial, and it, it runs mm -hmm. along political parties unfortunately so right now our administration is very much uh, has always denied the existence and the, the extent of the problem and certainly that is part of the reason why it gets out of control yeah yeah exactly yeah and i mean the the role of the public is an important role yeah. um, too um and i mean i i know the situation here is uh, is not as bad as in the U.S. when it comes to public perception and uh, yeah, that's because in Germany they listen to you apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, um, we have a we have Angela Merkel, whom whom people really listen to and uh, who understands things. Um, yeah, we we have we were lucky about this early detection. Um, this helps everybody, um, and we are now we are now losing public trust um, certainty. Mm -hmm. So it's it's now really like we have, um, yeah, we have the same phenomenon that that you. So why you, are, why are you you losing public trust? Um, well, because the disease is not existing; it's not there. And uh, I mean, now what we see is the, the typical um, finding. We are now, even though the incidence goes up, the fatalities don't go up. There are no dead people, and um, so this actually prevents people who are not into the numbers and who don't don't um, who have no adherence to the principles of the whole phenomenon. Who who don't see the, the contingency of uh, how uh, 
I don't know, how infections come about, how fatalities uh, come about somewhat later, how um, fatality is expectably lower once you have students infected in, instead of inhabitants of care homes. Um, they, if you don't make this connection, you lose the belief. You, you stop believing. You, you just see some numbers and some charts and you think, what the hell is going on here? I, I, uh, the economy is losing 10%, right? Mm. So, Christian, um, there have been, I think, two reports now which are pretty reliable accounts of reinfections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, what is your view of uh, immunity after infection? Um, you know, does everyone make an immune response? Is it durable? Is it protective? What are your thoughts? Well, it's the typical sloppy coronavirus immunity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Sloppy <laughs> coronavirus immunity with Christian Drossen. I can see this is a, this is a show title. That's great. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. I like that. <laughs> No, I mean, of course, these are interesting case descriptions. Um, I think they are very well carried out, um, especially if you if you uh, are informed about the, the, there are more data about these cases and that these are really nice data. Um, but I think these are still uh, rare cases in, in let's say in a in a range that I wouldn't be surprised to see courses like this in the range of one or five percent of of all patients. This is still rare. Um, from the view of an infectious diseases epidemiologist who is worried about the, the fate of the pandemic, so who worries about the next, let's say, year, um, to keep it short, right? So this will be the, the focus uh, where really the fate of the pandemic is determined and um, where really, unfortunately, first countries will have gone through the establishment of, of population immunity, yeah. not the US, not Germany, but areas in Africa and, uh, and let's say India, this is really worrisome still. It's just, you know, we have, since the very beginning, we've always been told by, by Ralph Barrick and others that coronavirus, as you said, immunity is sloppy and the common cold coronas, immunity does not last. Uh, and you, that's why you get reinfection. So is there reason to think that there will be a similar situation? And maybe these reinfections are not going to be so unusual in the end. Yeah, but I'm not worried about these. Um, so I, what I think is um, the second infection is a mild infection. And there is based on vaccine studies and based on patient observations. And by the way, also based on this Hong Kong patient, but uh, also uh, other observations that you can make in, uh, let's say, ch children versus adult infections with uh, other coronaviruses. Um, it seems that the that subsequent infections are not the severe systemic pneumonia type of infection. These are then upper respiratory tract disease um, phenomena, and uh, you have replicating virus in the upper respiratory tract. Um, you have T cell immunity, certainly, um, and this, this is very likely to be much more long lasting than, mm. um, than the, let's say the B cell immunity, the antibodies. Um, and this may be the reason why the lung is, is then actually not severely affected anymore. Um, it's also the question whether the viral load difference from the first to second um, infection in the upper respiratory tract is sufficient to stop the onward transmission or the contribution of this individual to onward transmission. Also, whether the existence of some antibodies in the fluids of the upper respiratory mm. tract mucosa actually shields the virus from being infected. Mm. There are antibodies around. So the virus goes into the mucosa. There is replication and shedding. But there are also antibodies swimming there. Um, and they stick to the surface of the virus. Mm. And once you exhale this virus, sure. it may not really be very infectious. Yeah. So uh, this raises a question in my mind. Um, I'm just uh, putting this together because the uh, infection with SARS-CoV-2 uh, in humans is described as being uh, an upper and a lower respiratory infection, whereas the um, sort of endemic uh, human coronaviruses are described as being really confined uh, to an upper respiratory infection. Uh, but I wonder, in children, 
-hmm. with SARS-CoV-2. Is there typically a lower respiratory involvement or is it confined to the upper respiratory tract? Uh, I'm wondering if the differences that we're seeing here have to do with um, sort of the ages that are susceptible with the two viruses. Yeah. Yeah, I understand uh, the, what you're aiming for, but I, I don't think there are really reliable data on children there. Okay. So sputum from children in a, in a sufficiently large cohort, I haven't seen any paper on that, and it's really difficult to do that. So from 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 very early days in this, from a, an early conversation with Ralph, uh, I and I think others on the podcast have been trying to turn this into a common human coronavirus, okay? Mm -hmm. But a difference is that this is described as infecting the lower respiratory tract. But maybe if you establish uh, the infection initially in children and it's confined to the upper respiratory tract and then you establish immunity that in the long run, that's what it looks like is an upper respiratory yeah. tract infection. Yeah. Once, once it has become endemic and once the initial infection occurs during childhood for everyone, yeah, I'm, I also think so. Um, and then, of course, things will happen to the virus, right? Um, the uh, interesting thing, by the way, um, I, I don't want to really connect this uh, uh, theologically, but it is an interesting <laughs> observation that the initial infection in this Hong Kong patient was with a virus that had the open reading frame number A truncated. Mm. Um, so this is like the, the Singapore variant and this SARS, uh, the SARS-1 virus that, that also has, has a truncation there. Um, I, well, I, I don't know whether, whether this can be directly linked, but it is interesting um, to, to observe that there is somebody who is infected by such a probably a slightly attenuated virus, has a mild course, has an um, almost undetectable antibody response. Um, and then gets a second infection early. Um, and then, of course, knowing what viruses do, once they are really in a low incidence situation, you have these population bottleneck phenomena, they will delete accessory reading frames like, like other common cold coronaviruses also have done. So we know for the, like, let's say the, the 229E com common cold coronavirus, um, its ancestor, or, or let's say co-ancestor in, in camels and bats has additional open reading frames that we don't see anymore um, in, in the human virus. It has just been lost. There is an open reading frame just even downstream of the nucleocapsid, which is not mm. very unusual for coronaviruses. What's, uh, what, what's the extent of global spread of the ORFATE uh, deletion SARS-CoV-2? It is um, still very rare, and it's it's not um, a continuous lineage. So the Singapore variant has disappeared soon. Um, and um, if you look at the at the alignment now, um, there are some I don't know how many, maybe thirty or forty in the in all the known strains that have in fact uh, stop codons at. And, and these are at different sites. There are some with deletions, small deletions, um, out of frame deletions. So it's, it seems that there is not very strong pressure on the maintenance of this reading frame. But then when such a lineage competes with a, with wild type, wild type will take over. These lineages don't seem to establish themselves. Hmm. So based on your uh, scenario with the Hong Kong patient, it would seem to me that we should be working on attenuated vaccines. Well, not only on this basis, but definitely we, we should do that. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there so are a few. The question is whether that should, be, should have a different backbone or whether that should be a coronavirus-based vaccine. Um, I would opt for the second. But, um, yeah, there are, um, there are reasons to, to go for a vector vaccine as well. Yeah. Uh, Tristan, we talked about this last time. I want to revisit it. Can you summarize for us the course of shedding and transmission from the day of infection, onset of clinical symptoms, and beyond? Uh, what, what are the kinetics? Well, there, there was a um, there was this really important paper from uh, from Hong Kong um, that had a, a correction. Um, so it seems that one of their mathematical, their, their computer models had a had a slight uh, coding error, but I think the final result remains unchanged. 
Um, and this nicely overlaps with um, the excretion kinetics based on RT-PCR and the, way, the, the timing of when you're still able to isolate viruses in culture, mm -hmm. how this uh, somehow um, coincides or, or takes turns with the development of neutralizing antibody. So um, as a rule of thumb, and this is certainly just a rule of thumb, it's, it's imprecise, but um, I think it's, it's a good working model also for, for epidemiologists you, you can consider the patient infectious for a week. Mm -hmm. And the first two days of this week are before symptoms onset and the, the remaining five days are after symptoms onset. And it seems that really a large fraction of patients are actually symptomatic, like 85% of them have symptoms. And it, it also seems like if you speak to people who really work with patients and who see patients, um, if you ask them a second and a third time, it's possible that nearly 100% are symptomatic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, what's a symptom? Yeah. 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 So uh, this is this kinetics for this is for mild infections. Does it differ for serious infections, the people who go to the hospital? We do not see the first week of symptoms, let, let's say from a virological point mm -hmm. of view virus presence and so on, to differ between severe and mild cases. Um, also, the viral load in this first uh, week of, of disease is not really very different. It, it's possible, based on some studies, that there is a slight, slightly lower viral load, but actually it's not. Actually, it's the same viral load. This is all a big mess because you, you rarely see really sequentially sampled patients and so on. Yeah, all I mean, these difficulties. I've seen but. it this I've seen it concluded that if you're the patients in the hospital can transmit or shed at least for up to twenty days, which is longer than the well, seventh. Yeah. They can they can shed. But they're probably not transmitting in that period? No, well, I would say certainly not. Um it's really like if you have a, a highly invasive procedure like an unprotected intubation mm. during week two, then there is still transmission. Um, but in fact, in fact, the, the normal way of the, the bulk of infections, it doesn't happen after the first week. I see. So, uh, have, uh, Vincent, have we discussed this Hong Kong paper? Yeah, we did last time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the last show? Yeah, dude, last show. <laughs> Jeez. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't go there. Look that, go look that up again. We did, and then there's no, no, the a patient. Yeah, no, I'm talking about the the study that uh, Christian's talking about uh, about the kinetics. No, yes, that, we discussed that, the patient, yeah, but the, the the kinetics. I don't uh, think so. No. No, okay. I'm, I'm not. I'm. I'm. When I, when I describe, let's say, the shedding, this is not about the Hong Kong single patient study. This is the overall impression yeah. about several viral load studies that are now around. Uh, right. Okay. I thought you were. I, I thought you were referring to a uh, no. a study from Hong Kong a while ago that did all the kinetics, not just the reinfection. Exactly. There is a lot of work from Hong Kong, very good work. And then there is very good work from Rotterdam. Um, we contributed a, a smaller paper, but that was in the beginning where, where there were many patients around. Um, but the overall impression and, and this combined with um, an epidemiological paper from Hong Kong, from Gabriel Leung's group, um, this nicely overlaps. So it's really like what, what they did is they analyzed transmission pairs that were really very well recorded. Um, and they really um, averaged over the recorded times of transmission and then put this into a computer model and so on. Uh, but this really nicely overlaps with observations from virus isolation studies and viral load uh, shedding studies mm -hmm. over the first and second week. If it's uh, not too much trouble, could you uh, send me references to those uh, papers? Because I'm, I'm really interested in those. And yeah. you mentioned a Hong Kong study where the, there was a correction, but didn't really change exactly. the... Yeah. This was a like this the typical uh, coding error that's discovered after right. patient. But, right. yeah. So I'm interested in those papers as well. Because I've been, uh, I mean, to tell you the truth, my old department has asked me to 
give a talk on the pandemic. Okay, and this has been a it's been a great exercise because because it's really forced me to focus in on some of this stuff. And it'd be you know you look for a paper that's got this wonderful graph in it that puts all this stuff together, but it's not there. Okay, uh, but, I will send you some PowerPoint slides. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. That's, that, yeah. Send them to I appreciate that. Send them to both of us, please. And and uh, when you give the talk, Rich, then you can give it on Twiv the next time. Okay. <laughs> so, Christian, these kinetics do they differ in asymptomatic people, or do we not have the data? There are hints um, that the shedding could be shorter rather than lower in uh, in asymptomatic people. Okay. But you, and also in children, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Shorter rather than lower. Okay. Can I ask my drug question? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did we do this paper before? Uh, Christian, your name is on a, a paper from uh, April in Cell about uh, using. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The protease inhibitors. We did. Uh, what's what What has. Can you update us on that? What's what's the story? Yeah, well, I mean, um, this is uh, yeah. These are so camostat is a, is a, a serine protease inhibitor, and um, it definitely uh, blocks the entry there, right? Um, it's a TMP RSS two inhibitor. Um, um, so this is all very plausible, and it's so plausible, and, and fortunately, because Camostat is, is cleared in Japan for chronic pancreatitis, clinical studies have begun. Um, but I haven't seen any results, um, and people are some people are skeptic whether the um, accessible dose is sufficient that you can reach in the lung, um, and so on, all of these problems. Um, uh, we also want... Well, we have actually a clinical study cleared to clear to begin here in Berlin um, with a very high dose of this drug, mm -hmm. um, but no patients, right? <laughs> um, I think it should be given early. Um, yeah. And there are, I'm, I'm aware of, of at least two other clinical studies, but probably there are more because the drug is available. Right. So I, I'm, uh, I'm sorry that I can't tell more. There is That's fine. I just want to know the status. So speaking of drugs, Christian, I've, I've sort of developed this idea that an antiviral is not going to be much use to a patient who is hospitalized. And that, you know, the remdesivir, yes. the monoclonals, is that, do you think that makes sense? Well, for the monoclonals, um, I think there is, a, there is application for, for late phase mm -hmm. patients as well. Um, but for, yeah, for the chem, for all, for the chemical drugs, especially the antiviral uh, drugs, of course, you want to give them early. And this is somehow, um, a conflict of indications because the first week is mild for all cases, irrespective of, of the later outcome. Um, so you could, um, make decisions based on, let's say risk groups of patients. Mm -hmm. Um, that would be a possibility. Um, but then, you have a high risk patient who is uh, well who has underlying conditions and you give them a drug that may be an experimental drug so usually actually you would prefer more healthy people and look for effect on on virus replication viral shedding first um, so that's the approach with with most of these clinical trials now um, that they try to enroll rather healthy people early after diagnosis and then look for changes to the virus virological parameters first rather than disease outcome. I mean, ideally, we would like to have a drug like Tamiflu where you could get an antigen test and then get it at the earliest symptoms, right? And everyone. Yeah, and, and, I, and you know how early you have to give Tamiflu to have an effect. Yeah. Right. Now, why did you say you think monoclonals could be of use in uh, in hospitalized patients? Because Thank you, Vincent. I was, that was my <laughs> question. <laughs> Basically, because of the experience with convalescent plasma. So it seems, based on some studies, that there is an effect even on severe uh, cases uh, in the late phase. So this should apply to monoclonals as well. But I'm I'm not an expert in this. Okay. 
Yeah, there's a lot of controversy about convalescent plasma oh, over yes. here. Yeah. Oh, yes. And, but uh, that's, I'm not speaking about this political controversy, yeah, but there are clinical study data. Well, as Daniel Griffin on TWIV has said, uh, you know, the problem with plasma is that it has clotting factors, which is not good yeah. to give. So a monoclonal should be better because it will be purified. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, Rich, do you have anything else to ask? I'm good. Brianne? Uh, my only question um, is slightly off topic almost. Um, given that so many people are listening to you now and you are working on your podcast, um, any sort of big changes that you feel or how do you feel about how this has influenced how science communication has sort of influenced what's going on in your life? Well, science communication isn't a big thing in Germany. Um, so um, I, I started this and I mean, it's, it's of course uh, taking a lot of time. Um, at the same time, I'm not doing a lot of media work actually beyond this podcast. And I've, I've now, so I had a summer break of two months where I didn't do anything. Um, we are now starting over and I, there is a colleague who is now doing uh, the podcast with me and uh, we are just doing one episode per week. So it's my turn every 14 days. And that's actually not a big thing. Um, so this is how, how my life can, uh, can somehow as a, as a researcher uh, go back to normal and how I can uh, go back to, to writing up stuff we have in a pipeline and so on. Um, this is necessary. I don't want to become a journalist or a TV professor or something. I'm I'm on the TV <laughs> very rare in Germany. <laughs> Actually, I joined three talk shows during the whole time, uh, and that was, I think, in March and April, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a couple of letters. One from before I let you go. I just wanted to tell you. Uh, one is from Jonas Binding, who who's the founder of RapidTests.de. Yeah, I, I saw his email, yeah. Oh, that's right. He copied you. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had one from Mary who said, I regard Christian Drosten as the foremost world expert on coronavirus. My one regret is <laughs> I that... I wouldn't agree to that. <laughs> my one regret is that his writing and podcasts are not widely available in English. Perhaps we would be in a better place if they were. Christian, maybe you should come to TWIV once a month. Uh, no. <laughs> and you could. He's got then, enough to do. Then it's in English, you know, because there are a lot of English speaking people out there. Um, yeah. And, uh, this this podcast is is in German. It's very colloquial, but it yeah. can be translated. <laughs> and then we then we had one. <laughs> when we had an email from Kyle, who is an American living in Germany, and. Mm -hmm. um, he he sent us all these uh, statistics from the uh, Robert Koch Institute. Uh, and one of the things he pointed out is that the death rate has gone down substantially in Germany. And he wanted to know what your thoughts uh, on the reasons for that were. I th he must be referring to the case fatality rate yes. has gone down because more yes. young people are, uh, are infected now. It's now the students taking over. I see. And, and the older people are staying out of the way, you think? Yes, exactly. Staying home, that's great. There, there is su such low incidence that uh, some changes of behavior can do the job within families, right? People avoid seeing grandparents all of the time and so on. That's I have another ridiculous question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, in some past TWIV episodes, we have had um, some discussion of um, correct pronunciation of the name of the scientist Vincent mentioned um, with the Institute who has the postulates. Um, ha, Koch. Ha, yeah, Koch. 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 It's Koch. 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 Okay. There you go. So we have this German, um, which is difficult, but just think about a, an angry little rodent. That you <laughs> it's <stir. laughs> it makes. <laughs> 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 That's how you practice it. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Christian Drosten from the Institute of Virology, Charité Hospital, Berlin. Thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you for Thanks, having me. Thanks, Christian. That was great. Thank you. That was great. Bye-bye. See you. Uh, you know, one thing I... I guess you uh, didn't want to come on TWIV once a month, right? No. Too bad. <laughs>
No, he was pretty clear about that. Well, politely so. But I think clear. he should because I, I, there are more English speakers out there than German speakers, but that's fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. we'll, we'll have to just pull up the slack, right? Yeah, we, we'll just need to also, you know, find some people who can translate. I, I uh, appreciated his reference to um, uh, discussions about ORF 8 as being potentially theological. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. That was good. <laughs> that was pretty good. funny. Uh, and I also appreciate, you know, lots of times, uh, lots of times, you know, I think I know the answer to something or I have an opinion on something, but it, it's really good to get another perspective, even if it's just, you know, confirming what you think you already know. And uh, I really appreciate uh, his perspective coming from a quite a different environment. Oh, you have to, you have to have other perspectives. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and when you make decisions, you need to have diverse opinions. You can't just sit by you yourself. You can't make it up? If you you're can't a just make up your reality? If you're a university professor, you just can't sit in your office and make decisions. No, I'm sorry. You need to have people <laughs> feeding you information. I'm saying that because I think some of them do. <laughs> no, I, I think that's very true. And I really appreciated hearing about how everything was handled in Germany and how we ended up in two different places and trying to figure out what the variables were. Right. And I think the, the take home message for everyone should be he's worried because yeah. even though their cases are low, the virus is still there right. and it yep. could explode. And we, we sh I'm going to take a look at that uh, percolation paper. Maybe we need to yeah. discuss it briefly at least. Yeah. I didn't fully understand the whole percolation concept. So it would be nice to look at that more closely. All right, we'll look at it on Friday. How's that? This okay. Friday, which is in two days. Right. Quick turnaround. Can I come and leave early? <laughs> what? Yeah. You can come and leave early. Sure, you can do whatever you want. Um, But I have to say, both you and Kathy were absent on Friday, and people were complaining. Uh, I had no women on Twitter. I said, hey, this is not my fault. I know. I had a meeting. I have another meeting at 3.30 on Friday, but I can come and leave early. <laughs> It's a, it's fine. I told them it's uh, you're always welcome to every episode, and I understand that you have other obligations, but just you shouldn't blame Vinny. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's do some email. Uh, the first one from Dave. I agree with him completely. He says, "I think you buried the lead when discussing Fauci's podcast appearances." And then he, I think this is a quote from the Times article. Mm -hmm. Whether by design or not, Dr. Fauci has effectively circumvented efforts by the White House to mute him. Since Mark Meadows took over as chief of staff on March 31st, White House communications officials have approved very few requests from major outlets. But there is no such review process for smaller ones, like the weekly podcast of the Journal of the American Medical Association or the KCOD radio show. Why don't you put TWIV in there? <laughs> so it's a bloody virology podcast for god's sake it would yeah but we aren't one of the smaller ones vincent oh you're right you're absolutely right right okay back to dave we're we're we're, we're pretty close to a major outlet you know dixon told me the other day i complained too much no he sent me an email over the weekend he said you know you should back off you complain too much and i said i'm not because uh no, who else is going to complain? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's even a term at this point. You can't stop now right. that we've just no. we've come up with rack and yelling. But what I right. said to him is, you know, all the other hosts are pretty moderate. You guys are are fair. You never you don't really complain too much. You don't criticize anyone. You're you're very good academicians. So I have to be the exception. I don't know why, but I've complained all my life. Uh, listen. Uh, part of the charm of this whole thing is we are just who we are. Okay. So it is, it is as one of the emailers said last time. Yeah. Anyway, Dave continues. It seems likely that Fauci's podcast appearances were because he was muzzled by the current administration from appearing on TV. They forgot to explicitly forbid podcasts and alternative venues. And Fauci dutifully tried to get his message out via these alternative mechanisms since he needs to contradict the falsehoods coming from elsewhere, for example, CDC, FDA. Did you guys see um, Varma's had an op-ed in the Times yesterday, along with the head of the Rockefeller Foundation, I forgot his name, 
saying we can't. Uh, we ought to look that up. Yeah. We can't. Trust yes, I saw that. See anymore. Uh, Harold Varmus. Okay. Yeah, I saw that. That was amazing. Um, Dave is in Oakland, seventy-two Fahrenheit. Um, I mean, why couldn't the White House just now say you can't do podcasts, right? They could have done that, and I don't see why it would prevent them. They do whatever they want, right? <laughs> but right. Uh, Raj, uh, Rajiv Shah. Rajiv Shah, thank you. Um, the um, When I first emailed uh, Fauci's office, I didn't email Fauci. I actually emailed someone I know in his office to ask for advice. How, how would I go about asking permission <laughs> and um he says we think he should be talking to more sciencey types than he has been so i don't you know maybe they just thought you know he's doing a lot of news right major news but he needs to talk to scientists like us um of course i think we would talk to him anytime he wants yeah, we'll, uh, yeah. We'll, we'll anytime you want to come on tony just let us know so uh, we'll make i don't space i don't mean you know, this makes a lot of sense but yeah, we didn't talk about this because we I was personally so wrapped up in the fact that we got a nice mention. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Eileen writes, good morning. It is a sticky 82 degrees in Holland, Pennsylvania. My husband introduced me to your podcast about a month ago, and I have been listening to them almost every day since. Thank you for being a source of unbiased scientific information in such an uncertain time. I am writing today because many schools in my area are reopening and their instructions for parents state that no backpacks or reusable containers are allowed in the classrooms. This means all children must bring disposable lunch bags and drinks. This confused me since I thought that most of the transmission happens through droplets in the air. I thought that there wasn't much concern over surface transmission. Also, with the distancing in the classroom, the lunch containers would only really be touched by the owner and maybe the teacher. Is this precaution necessary? It seems more harmful to the environment than beneficial to anyone's health. Am I missing something? Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us all, Aileen. Um, I kind of agree with Aileen. Yeah, that's sort of I do too. I don't think there's any ro very little role for, for fomite transmission, right? Right, and I think that as long as... Um, those lunch containers are really being handled by their owner, the yeah. the student. Um, that ma it makes a lot of sense actually to to do that instead of um, other ways of thinking about uh, doing lunch. There are other c concerns I would think about about school lunches far before a reusable lunch bag. This reminds me of a cartoon that I saw this last week of a mother with her uh, small school kid who's just come home from school and is wearing a face mask. And she says to him, uh, that's not the same face mask that uh, you left with today. And the kid says, yeah, Tony had a much cooler looking face mask. So we traded. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Rich, can you take the next one? Carol writes, please help me make sense uh, some sense out of this story from Kaiser Health News. And um, look, I have not looked at this. Okay. Trump is sending fast, cheap COVID tests to nursing homes, but there's a hitch. Have you looked at this? Yeah, article? yeah. Okay, so let me finish the letter and then you can comment on this. Uh, does this make any sense? What about the 40% who don't have symptoms? How different are these tests from the rapid testing supported by Michael Minna? Thank you for all you do. Twib is my most trusted news service. The interview with Robert Fully Love was amazing. So much of the news is uh, framed in pessimism these days. His optimism was inspiring. I agree. Amazing. And uh, Carol is uh, an RN. So what about this uh, story? All right. So what we have here, <clears throat> um, so Becton Dickinson and Kidell, these are antigen tests, but they're not MENA. They're not MENA rapid cheap tests. Uh, they require, um, and, and they're saying, so the FDA wants them only used on symptomatic patients, right? And that's the problem. It's not a minute approach, which is everybody to see, to do a screen, right? So the FDA is hung up on this. And I was talking to someone about this last week. They're hung up that they approve diagnostics for people who are sick. They don't typically do asymptomatic stuff. And so 
their their thinking has to be changed and people are working on that. But that's where this is coming from. They're intended for patients with symptoms. And as you know, last week, the CDC said, don't test patients without symptoms or test them less, okay? And that's what Harold Varmus was objecting to. So this doesn't make any sense. Um, I think in a nursing home situation, you would want to test people frequently and see who's potentially infected, even if they're asymptomatic, right? <laughs> it makes sense to me. Yes. And I sort of get the idea that these also um, require a maybe a somewhat trained person to do them instead of yes. the, the minute test that can be done completely at home yeah. um, without any training. Yeah. Yeah. It's a difference between a diagnostic test to and a screen where you want to know if you're infected that you can do yourself. It, it, we're not quite there, but we can get there very quickly. Yeah. The Abbott test, you, you have to pipette some buffer onto the lateral flow device before you put the sample on, right? And you can imagine that some people are not going to be able to do that. It just has to be, a, what is it, a leaky? Lick a stick. Lick a stick. stick. <laughs> uh, did, uh, remind, did I hear uh, Christian uh, correctly that he was estimating about 15% asymptomatic? Did I get that number yeah, right? Yeah, that is what he said. Yeah, and he said uh, if you And then ask he said if you times, ask him closely enough, it, the number goes yeah, down. We've talked about this, right? That the idea that right. sometimes some people have a higher barrier for pain than others. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, th this is a slippery number because, you know, right. I've had in my mind numbers more like uh, 30 or as even, even as high as 40%. But I guess it depends on yeah. uh, who you're asking and how you ask them. I agree. It's hard. I thought you were going to ask. He said that mm -hmm. the saliva is less sensitive. Oh, yeah. But I thought it was pretty good based on the Yale study, right? Yeah. So yeah. I have to go look uh, I, and see. I, we need to see some more. Uh, some more rigorous, uh, maybe they're out there. I don't know. I'm not aware of them. Head-to-head uh, -head comparisons of saliva, nasal, nasopharyngeal, and probably an oral swab as well, you know. Next one's from Charles. Hello, Twivers. Just a pissed-off human living in Chapel Hill where the weather's okay, 81F, 27C with a bit of rain. Convalescent plasma, quote, truly historic announcement, end quote. Yeah, right. Quote, we dream in drug development of something like a 35% mortality reduction, end quote, is just BS. No control, no possible measurement of mortality rejection, reduction. Oh, more BS about the 35%. To me, a 35% reduction in mortality at this point in time means that of 100 sick people that would have died, only now only 65 will die. That does not seem to be what Trump and Azar mean. See the Stat News article or in the pipeline. Yes. Um, I'm surprised that Christian thinks there's some effect. I mean, there's a, it's very difficult to suss out. Oh, yesterday, a controlled trial of plasma was just published where they couldn't, they, they had to stop it because they didn't have enough patients. And it's not clear if it has any effect. There are no, there are controlled trials uh, out there, right? But there are none that show an effect. Am I correct about that? Well, the one that just came out yesterday, um, and let me pick up the. Uh, yeah, I didn't think there were randomized control trials so that had come one. out, but I did not see this uh, study that here came out yesterday. Convalescent plasma, a multi center, um, a multi center randomized clinical trial. It's a it's a bio archive, med archive. Um, and so this is it. Uh, the trial was stopped after first interim analysis due to the fall in recruitment related to pandemic controls. Now, with 81 patients randomized, there were no patients progressing to me mechanical ventilation or death among the 38 assigned to receive plasma versus 6 out of 43 progressing to con in the control arm. So it's just not enough. T okay, so 0 versus 6 Progressing to ment uh, mechanical ventilation, very very mild. You know, it's a small effect, if anything. But they had to stop this trial. All right. So okay. So the correct statement then is that uh, there are no completed. That's right. 
uh, controlled trials with plasma. Yeah, the others, okay. all of them have been observational so far with complications, okay. as Daniel Griffin has pointed out. And it certainly right. didn't justify the emergency use authorization. Uh, but, you know, science is, look, I get letters all the time saying uh, they hate when we get political. Well, you know what? The politicians are, get sci are getting scientific. Do you hate yeah. that? Yeah. Come on, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it if you know someone really objected to my talking about the poll where sixty percent of Republicans say that the number of deaths in the U.S. is acceptable, well, it's science as far as I'm concerned because it's about people dying from a virus infection, and I, I'm astounded that it could be politically biased like that. It doesn't make any sense to me. That's all. I'm not saying anything else. We're, about it. we're talking about what is seen in the world as response to in response to viruses and unfortunately what is actually seen is also influenced by politics you can't really yeah. separate those and things if there's a if fda makes a decision that doesn't make any sense and the cdc makes a decision that doesn't make any sense and the heads of both are political appointments made by the current administration we question it so uh i was thinking about this uh just last night and uh this morning i made this comment many episodes ago uh, to quote my friend Bob Chen, mm -hmm. uh, public health is a mashup of science and politics. Okay. Sure and what is. we're talking about here, we're talking about some hardcore science, but we're also talking about public health. Okay. And so politics is a part of that. Yes, um, for sure. And you, there's, there's no way around it. No question. I mean, and if anything, this pandemic has emphasized that, right? How, yep. how it is. And and you don't have to go far back in history to see it. I'm thinking of um, swine flu outbreak in 1976. So I was a graduate student at the time in Peter Palacio's lab. You know, there's a couple of cases of swine flu in Fort Dix, New Jersey. So the virologist overreacted and they had a vaccine made and the, thing, the, the outbreak never went anywhere. And, you know, Gerald Ford pushed it and he didn't get reelected. Maybe that's one of the reasons he didn't. <laughs> anyway, let me finish with Charlie. Fatalities from COVID-19 that I will really miss. One, John Prine, singer and songwriter. Two, trust in the CDC as expressed by Alan Dove in a late May 2020 twiff. Quote, we have indeed come to a point where we do have to second guess announcements made by the CDC. And that's, of course, Harold Varmus and Rajiv, Rajiv Shah. And uh, tr three, trust in the FDA is shown by their inability to see the light of testing for the infectious in their BS from Sunday. <laughs> Thanks for letting me vent. And on a positive note for the work that has gone into TWIF, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. Um, Brianne, you're next. Sure. Elise writes, hi, TWIV friends. I am a pathologist from New Orleans, Louisiana. I love your show. A limerick I wrote for you. There once was a doctor called Fauci. He deems America's COVID response quite slouchy. He advocates isolation and testing is the rule, while implying that Trump is a fool. This makes our emperor quite grouchy. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and Elise uh, is an MD. Uh, this will go on That's to great, our Elise. page of poetry. <clears throat> I think the, the link is microbe.tv slash. Wasn't it Twiverse? Twiverse, T-W-I-V-E-R-S-E. Yeah, that's it. I made it a top-level page. Microbe.tv slash Twiverse. It's perfect, right? Twiverse, Twiv Universe yeah. verse. That was Kathy's idea, actually. No, I, I think one of my friends suggested it, um, and I think I brought it up. Uh, Rich, can you do the next one, please? Sure. Uh, is it Varian or Varian? Verlon. Oh, Verlon, I see. I, and, uh, I've gone to uh, big print, no glasses as so that I can be far <laughs> enough back in the, in the picture frame. So I don't get everything right. Verlon writes, greetings, Twiv. I'll start with the usual comments. Love your podcast and the serious, rational, scientific discussions about COVID-19 related and other infectious disease issues. Given our long connections with Liberia, Ebola was of special concern. As many listeners write, I only really understand about a third to a half of the detail, but 
get the main points and the issues of very valuable information and educational service. And if you hang around long enough, you'll get more. <clears throat> I am not a quote, hard scientist, nor an academic. My decision to change to the arts and humanities was based on my love for its subject matter, but was finalized at the time I set the record for glass breakage due to an explosion in my undergraduate organic chemistry lab, a record I'm told held for the last 50 years. Organic chemistry <clears throat> is a break point for lots of people. But to those facing that, hang in there. Actually, organic chemistry is pretty cool. Oh, it's awesome. It's, it makes sense. I, it, it makes sense. Uh, well, you know, I'd like to do it again because the truth is I went into that class thinking I'm going to ace this sucker, okay, because I knew it was important and they'd set it up as a barrier. And I didn't think that way about all classes. What was your text? But the truth is, I, the truth is I got through it by memorizing it rather than understanding it. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to go back again because I think I could understand it now. Was your text multiple, Morrison and Boyd? Uh, oh, yeah. Morrison and Boyd and, and a brilliant, brilliant teacher. Uh, Bennett was his name. And uh, this guy was better with it. That was, remember back in the day we had blackboards? Of course. And chalk? Of course. <laughs> okay. This was actually a green board and chalk. And he drew uh, just the, the most magnificent structures. And he would start on the, there was about four panels. He would start on the left panel and fill that up from top to bottom and then move to the next one and then down to the right in this highly organized fashion as he spoke, okay? And we were taking notes. That was back in the day. We didn't have overheads. We didn't have PowerPoints. Any, you know, you wrote all this stuff down. And by the time he got back down to the fourth board, okay, you were done with the notes from the first board, mm. okay? So that was done, and he would go back and start over. He'd arrest the, yeah. erase the first board and keep going. Great. He was absolutely brilliant. But, you know, all those little arrows that chased electrons around and that kind of stuff, I never understood that stuff. I, I kept up with it. I, I took advanced organic theory um, in graduate school. Uh, and I understood the first semester, the second semester was tougher. Uh, but I'd like to go back and do all that stuff again. Anyway, sorry. That's Got okay. <laughs> but the skill with the, the sliding boards is really gone because people do yeah. PowerPoints now. But I do think I was – I just loved – seeing how people organized it, then push it up and pulled it down. And mm -hmm. yeah. it's just an art, it, right? It is. Yeah. And it's really fun to do. And it, if – once you figure out how to do it, it can be incredibly useful. For sure. Uh, actually, there's a, uh, I suppose, a subtext in my little uh, rant here, which is, and I think about this frequently, that, you know, all of the sort of prerequisites that you take to get to the stuff that you're really interested in, like general chemistry, a lot of that went over my head, and I and I didn't really enjoy it. Organic was just a chore. <laughs> there were lots of other courses that were really a chore, and the occasional thing that really turned me on, photosynthesis, blew my mind. That's okay, cool. um, but you know, I I felt like I, I there was out there there was this vague goal. I think I knew I wanted to be a scientist, and this was how you did it. There were these chores that you got through. So for those of you out there anticipating this, uh, it, you know, it can all yeah. be done. Yeah. Organic chemistry doesn't have to, don't listen to them. doesn't have to stop you. Okay. You can do this. <laughs> okay. On with the letter. From multiple TWIV discussions, I know some of your panelists and guests love participating in musical performance activities and are as anxious as our choir is to resume rehearsals and performances as soon as possible, but in a manner safe for the performances and the audience congregation in our case. On TWIV, you've discussed and evaluated a number of schemes to enable resumption of rehearsals and performances, but I don't think you've yet judged any approach to be safe, especially for choral performance. That's all correct. 
The latest scheme circulating among our acquirer's emailing list is a singer's mask. Aha, I've heard of this. Supposedly developed, supposedly, quote, developed by singers for singers by Broadway professionals to help contain droplets while allowing space around the mouth to sing comfortably. Sold by the Broadway Relief Project and presumably for a worthy cause, I'm skeptical that it can actually work effectively, especially for professional singers with well-developed techniques to empty their lungs of air, sound, and droplets. Your professional opinions? Hope my qualms are judged wrong by the Twiv gang. And uh, Verlin is a PhD. Uh librarian indiana university uh, uh, at indiana university and a uh research associate in folklore and ethnomusicology department okay let me look at this mask i'm very skeptical Uh, because i have seen this but oh this is a different one than i'm skeptical yeah i was expecting one that was clear uh i just i don't know why vernon verlin you've got it there's a huge force of expulsion here and I think it would leak around the sides and, and, and eventually get out. And uh, I don't think – I mean, of course, we don't have any studies to evaluate this, and we probably won't. But I just think this is not, not going to help. Uh, I ran – there was one uh, going around in the uh, uh, group that I sing with that was a similar type of thing where there was this uh, like uh, a plastic structure – that was a cage-like structure that kept the cloth, the fabric, off of your face, and uh, some foam around it mm-hmm. uh, for the comfort fit, and then a material on the outside that was called something like Bio Shield, okay, uh, which I thought was ridiculous to start with, but then I I looked into it, and in fact, this is a legitimate fabric made by a a company that makes PPE mm-hmm. and is interesting because it's got, um, uh, it's somehow chlorinated. Okay. And I mm-hmm. thought, wait a minute. Okay. Cause that's going to, the, even if you could have something with some sort of uh, chlorine barrier, that's going to decay yeah. over yeah. time. Right. But uh, actually there are um, EPA approved, uh, bleach type things that you can use to recharge this fabric. Huh. Okay. Interesting. So I thought it was interesting, but I'm worried I'm about still stuff like, coming out. Yeah, the absolutely. I'm yeah. skeptical because there's, they have, chill. there's they, they have a huge force of expulsion, right? <clears throat> yeah. And you're very good at emptying as he says the lungs. So I, I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, I, I, you know, I, even I just, Christian said uh, in I Germany, guess, they're not doing that sort of thing yet. Right. Yeah. Maybe I'm not as a uh, fanatic. I'm probably not as, I know I'm not as fanatic a uh, uh, singer as many of my colleagues, but just chill. Okay. <laughs> it, it, okay. It's going to take a while. Just chill. Use the time like we do uh, to study other aspects of, uh, of music. You know, it's okay. By the way, I wanted to say, Brianne, the, the light you have there in the back, it's great. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a very Good. common technique to to put lights in the background and give mm-hmm. a little. It's really cool. Good. I uh, actually just rearranged a little bit yesterday. Yeah, it's a, it really having a background light uh, gives a little. You know. I don't know what the word is. Thank anyway, it's, it's good. It's good stuff. It's what I try and do here, but it's not bright enough. I have to f- work on that. All right, anonymous writes. I'm just a med student at Stanford. Hmm. And very long-term time listener, you all helped prompt me to pursue medicine years ago. Given all the talk about reopening schools, I thought you would be interested in Stanford's approach. They never were willing to do frequent testing. Oh, my gosh. Why not? Too much money. They want to pocket it instead of giving it to the testing companies, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all about money. Their requirement is to do two tests a few days apart after arriving on campus and then monitor yourself for symptoms and report them daily via a cumbersome website 
that encourages copy paste. <laughs> Originally, they were going to have undergrads come back on campus in staggered groups, but now they are doing most of undergrad online, which is great since their testing plan isn't exactly ideal. I can understand why this person wants to be anonymous. However, grad students and a fair percentage of undergrads are going back are going to be back on campus. You would think they would do frequent testing and implement sensible processes for this small number, but no. Instead, they've created a campus compact that all students have to agree to be enrolled in. It authorizes the school to use a vaguely defined compact review board to investigate any breaches of compliance with their policies and impose almost any sanctions, including kicking students off campus. Their policies aren't necessarily terrible, but they are draconian and frankly weird. I doubt students will be able to comply with them completely, and even if they do, we will have no idea if it is working because they won't do any testing. Plus, they're still doing in-person exams and having students share a house with a requirement to physically distance from your housemate as if this will stop transmission. I personally feel like this, this is the school shirking responsibility for testing and trying to pull all of the responsibility, put all of the responsibility on students by essentially saying that if they don't follow all policies perfectly, they could be aggressively punished by a shadowy review board. Thanks, and please keep me anonymous. So that's horrible, Stanford. Shame on you. Um, I have two things to, to say. First, we shamed, uh, at least I criticized heavily Cornell many months ago for their lack of testing, and they've changed their tune, as uh, uh, Cindy Leifer told us on the recent Immune. They're doing two times a week. That's great. Did you hear that Penn State wants the students to sign a document taking all responsibility if they get infected and sick? Can, can you <laughs> yeah, imagine? I've seen some of those. That's that's crazy. Are they doing that at Drew? I don't think so, right, Brian? Um, we had to have we had to do a compact, and we have to um, do an app before we come on campus. Yeah. Um, but I would say that we are. Um, I know this is the case for students. We are at less than ten percent capacity. Wow. Um, both in terms of faculty or students. Um, and we're doing a lot in terms of distancing and masking and cleaning and, and things like that. I think to, to give, to put the responsibility on the students is shirking your duty as a university, because normally mm -hmm. there are a lot of risky things on campuses and you don't sign, make students sign things. It's just the lawyers are getting involved and this is terrible. I love it, you lawyers. I love you all, but this is bad. <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems odd to sort of, have students leave their homes um, and come to a college campus where interacting with others is sort of part of the point. That's right. Um, but then say, leave your home, but please stay in your room. Yes. It's crazy. It, it's a weird thing to expect. Okay. Uh, you're next, Brianne. All right. Judy writes, hello, Twiv gang. I'm me again. I remain a loyal listener, but from the sounds of it, you have gained many more since my first email to you on February 10th. My, how much has changed. The weather, however, remains around 30 degrees Celsius in Singapore. Being close to the equator, there really isn't much difference between February and August. I don't have a limerick or a haiku, but I do have a question. Being in Asia, I often talk to my colleagues in mainland China, and for a few months now, they have been telling me that the Chinese media thinks the source of infection in areas that had been virus-free for many months comes from imported frozen food, especially from South America, where there have been uncontrolled outbreaks. I kept looking for reports in Western media, but what little I could find theorized it was highly unlikely. I could not find any published experiments. It wasn't until the fresh outbreak in New Zealand did this theory come into prominence in Western news. And then yesterday, I saw this article in Forbes that re refers to the link below from BioArchive preprint. And she gives us both the link to the Forbes article and the BioArchive preprint. What does the TWIV team think about this? And what are the implications to all of us buying frozen meat and seafood at our local grocery store should be concerned? Um, regards, Judy. And Judy has a great PS, which is, I said infectious, not live. The TWIV team has trained me very well. Great, great job. job, Judy. You know the New Zealand outbreak was not from food. It's quite clear. No, even though right. that was suggested initially, right? Yeah. As soon as I heard the um, details about what was happening in terms of people returning um, to New Zealand um, and isolation and the issues there, it was very obvious that it was not from food. 
Um, I can't imagine an outbreak coming from frozen food. I don't think so. Now, now this paper, this preprint, what they do is they take f- f- food, cubes of food, they put a million PFU of virus in, so they have to do this in a BSL-3 lab, and they freeze it, and then at different times they thought, and there's no decline in infectivity, as you would expect, keep it frozen, right? But who's going to put a million PFU into food? I mean, I can't. Yeah, even if you sneeze on it, how it happen? And and uh, I just don't think there would be enough there to to. So the bottom line is, yes, it will it will retain infectivity in frozen food, but so what? What does it matter? And um, yeah, if if you were getting if something was happening where you were getting a million PFU in your food. I, I guess someone was, you know, like <laughs> licking your, I, I don't even know how you would get that, but I think there would be bigger problems in that case if someone was licking your frozen food. I'm not worried about this. Are you worried, uh, Rich Condit, about uh, No, no, Paris? I think this is uh, baloney. Uh, <laughs> no, they so, didn't use baloney. You know, as we've discussed before, <laughs> we freeze viruses to keep them uh, from being inactivated. Okay, so there's absolutely no surprise whatsoever that you can uh, freeze a freeze a virus and uh, that it'll be stable. That has uh, really uh, hardly anything to do with whether or not frozen food can serve as a vector right. of fomite for uh, transmission. This is malarkey. Also, don't you cook the food afterwards? <laughs> I do. Yeah, okay. you typically do, yeah. but the you know if you're thawing it, there's and touching it. But, you know, they tell you if you touch chicken, you should wash your hands immediately, right? Because it can have bacteria that are harmful to you. So just wash your hands and maybe not sniff frozen hamburgers. <laughs> Why would you do that anyway? I could see people who say, let's see if it's good and sniff the frozen hamburger. You know, I was, th- I was thinking about this this morning when the outbreak first happened. What's, which outbreak are you uh, talking about? Does COVID-19? I'm talking about uh, the... Uh, uh, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 um, oh, pandemic okay. from 2019-2020. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, when that <laughs> first happened, um, and uh, a lot of places locked down completely, that was in a the, – the environment at the time was we didn't know how this was transmitted. Yes. Okay. That's true. Um, and I think the uh, evidence is pretty compelling now that it's primarily uh, droplet transmission and fairly large droplets. And so that really uh, impacts pretty uh, heavily on the controls that you need to implement to uh, keep it under control. Now, uh, if another, when another pandemic comes along, uh, you know, uh, uh, I guess it depends on the virus, uh, of course. how you're gonna, how you're gonna react to it. But, but I guess, I guess my message is that the mode of transmission is critical in trying to figure out how you're going to deal with it on a population basis. You know, back in, uh, 2009, there was an H1N1 influenza virus pandemic, right? Which we covered on Twitter, yes, although... The- I would. I can imagine you would get a similar question. Do I worry about the virus being in food, frozen food? We never got any such thing. But then again, we didn't have that many listeners back then. But I can imagine any outbreak would bring up similar questions, right? Sure. Yeah, you always uh, in and when you talk about uh, spillovers. Okay, uh, I can remember questions about. Uh, potential spillovers of influenza from pigs and should I eat pork? Yes, of course. That, right? that was actually that kind of one stuff. During the, there was actually um, <clears throat> pork pork prices crashed during the 2009 because it was swine flu. This is swine origin, right? Right. Um, and this um, reminds me that there are other viruses. It kind of made me sad when you said, you know, the current outbreak and that's all we've been talking about really. But Friday we're going to do a non- SARS-CoV-2 paper. What are we going to do? Well, and Brian, you'll like this. It's a f- recent paper from Rafi Ahmed's lab showing that uh, when you get the inactivated flu vaccine, your your memory B cells are gone within a year. And I think it's I think relevant. I've seen this paper, and I I'm definitely coming and just leaving <laughs> early on Friday. Yeah. <laughs> so um, 
I think it's highly relevant to SARS-CoV-2. And um, yeah. so it, I think it's, you know, because some of them are inactivated and non-adjuvanted vaccines. So that'll be fun to do. I think, think doing papers that are relevant to SARS-CoV-2 but not SARS-CoV-2 will do more. Okay, Rich, you're next. Amy writes, hi, Twivers. I wonder if the team has ideas or perhaps Daniel Griffin could help with this question. Um, you hear a lot about how the 1918 flu had a high mortality rate in young people because they experienced cytokine storms. The explanation you hear is that they had well-functioning immune systems, and that made them prone to the immune system overreaction. Now we're hearing how COVID-19 severe illness and mortality is linked to whether infected people experience a cytokine storm. But now the people most at risk are the, the, of dying are older. How do we put these two examples together and make sense of them? A friend of mine wondered if the cytokine storm associated with COVID-19 might be connected to some earlier infection in their lives. Could this be the case? It might explain why older people are more likely to react badly to SARS-CoV-2. What do we understand about the risk factors for a cytokine storm for a COVID uh, infection? And does this new virus change the way we understand the mortality risks of 1918 flu? Thank you. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your podcast and how often I recommend it. Amy. Amy's from Portland. Um, I'm not sure we can. I think to some extent we're comparing apples and oranges, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I think so too. Um, I don't think we totally know how a cytokine storm happens after viral infection, although I personally find that a really fascinating question. Um, and there are a lot of viruses that lead to cytokine storm. Um, I think one issue that bears on Amy's question is that. Um, it seems like um, in the beginning, um, many of the symptoms people are seeing with COVID-19 are based on the virus and the immune um, issues are happening a little later. So perhaps if um, with people with sort of the good, quote unquote, good immune response um, are controlling the virus really early and don't progress to those later stages, whereas others might have the virus stick around longer. Um, to progress to problems, but I'm very much speculating uh, with that. I think that we'd love to know the answers to those things. And I'm not, I'm not even, I mean, this notion that uh, the uh, young people uh, react uh, dying of 1918 flu were dying from a cytokine storm. Uh, that's, uh, a novel idea to me, Vincent, you're looking something up. Yeah. I, I, so I, <laughs> I teach a paper on that and I actually know that I cite, I, I can picture the uh, figure that I think Vincent is looking for because I use that very figure. <laughs> I wanted to just give a more general description. And I know that in our textbook we had, it's called systemic inflammatory response syndrome, right? And that's cytokine storm. Um such a disastrous outcome often results if the host is naive and has not co-evolved with the invading virus, zoonotic infections, or if the host is very young, malnourished, or otherwise compromised. This type of pathogenesis, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, sometimes referred to as a cytokine storm, 1918 influenza. Similar syndromes are triggered by other microbial pathogens, toxic shock syndrome. Do you remember that? That's what I wanted to point oh, out. Oh, yeah. There was uh, tampons years ago were leading to toxic shock because they were contaminated and that gave rise to staph infections, yeah. I believe, right? And they would, mm -hmm. these people had cytokine storms, basically, in response, So, um, such as viruses. And, and we don't know how they're triggered. Lots of hypotheses, right? Now, Brianne, I think one of the, Amy's, think one of the biggest outstanding questions is why don't young children... Uh, uh, why are they so much less symptomatic with SARS-CoV-2? Uh, face of uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, I don't question. understand that. I don't think anybody. So not with that. the 1918 flu, right? Right. Right. And and this, uh, the toxic shock was uh, young people, right? Mm -hmm. 
I remember Matt Ralph Barrick said originally, 1918 flu, H5N1 influenza, SARS, MERS, SARS-2, all do this, and other viruses too, obviously. But by which you mean cytokine storm. Yeah, yeah. Now, one thing Amy brought up here, are they connected to some early infection? I think this is kind of a reference to the um, T-cell um, reactivity, right? It's, that was postulated to might be involved that we talked about with Shane Crotty, right? Mm-hmm. Right. But we don't know. We simply don't know if that's the case. All right. Um, it's me. We'll do one more round. Okay. Richard writes, hello, Twiver Cities. Hmm. Interesting. The Twiver Sites? Twiver Sites. Firstly, it's 19C and sunny here in Melbourne, Australia. And with a so-called second wave, I think it's a second peak of the first, of SARS-CoV-2, I am just a paramedic, and as such, I do often come face-to-face via an N95 mask with this virus. This has caused anxiety in my seven- and eight-year-old kids. I try to make videos for them of my work and how we employ processes to attempt to mitigate our exposure to risk. That's a great idea. Tonight, my youngest asked me what happens to a germ's body after it dies. (laughs) Great. (laughs) Kids are awesome. I explained a bit, partially guessed, about bacteria decomposition and being reused by other organisms, including us. He then asked about viruses. I said that viruses aren't alive. He disputed this by explaining that coronaviruses are happy (laughs) and that if viruses can be happy, then they must be alive. Absolutely. (laughs) Good for you. That's great. I love this definition. However, I feel it may be hard to come up with an experiment to prove or disprove it. (laughs) He proceeded to explain that influenza, Ebola, and Ross River all looked happy, but herpes, chicken pox, and polio all seemed sad. <laughs> Perhaps he can be a new diagnostic tool. Anyway, he finished by telling me that I should let that yelling guy, Vincent, know, and he would prove that my son is correct. So I am. <laughs> that yelling guy. <laughs> That's Secondly, wonderful. one of my colleagues is a beekeeper. I am also, but I only have three hives, so not a real one. He's worried about catching COVID from his bees. I pointed out that most people are very good at physical distancing from (laughs) bees, so he should be fine, B-E-E fine. It did make me wonder, though, is SARS-CoV-2 able to infect insects or any coronaviruses? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Thanks for all you do. It's educating myself and many other AMBOs, paramedics in Australia. Stay grumpy, Vincent. Stay grumpy. Um, See, you uh, can't stop complaining. (laughs) That's absolutely it. delightful. It's, I love that's it's, wonderful. Uh, I love the happy viruses. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, so I don't want to tell his son that this isn't true. So I'm not going to say it because how would no, you know absolutely. if a virus is happy you just by looking at pictures that have been drawn by humans? Yeah, I, I don't want to spoil I, it. I, yeah, but they I don't infect. Un- SARS-CoV-2 doesn't infect insects. Like, hey, what do you got there? Let me let me <laughs> guess. That looks happy. It, this this is. Supposed to be SARS-CoV-2. I, I I think it could kind of be happy. It looks happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is uh, supposed to be influenza, right? Uh, and it's, look, it's, they, they put the filamentous form. It's elongated. Yeah. But you can't really tell if it's happy or not, right? You really can't. Anyway. I wonder what happened. Uh, by the way, for yeah. uh, you people on audio, Brianne and Vincent oh, sorry are showing that. their uh, fuzzy their, virus, uh, their stuff, their stuffies of microbes. Is that a, is that a giant yeah. microbe? You know, I used uh, to have yes, a whole a giant, giant microbe. microbes. I used to have a whole slug of those. Where'd they go? I don't know. I'm going to have to look around with them for them. They must be around somewhere. But they uh, maybe they disappeared in the move to Austin. That would be a tragedy. My oh, students you know get a huge kick out of them when I show them in class. I yeah. may have actually uh, given them away when I retired to people at uh, UF. I'm just not sure. I'm not I, uh, as far as I know. SARS-CoV-2 does not infect insect cells of any sort. Uh, whether there is a corona of insects, I would doubt it. You know, corona is a family within the nidovirales, and that's quite a big family of viruses. There may very well be nidovirale like viruses of insects. Um, I'm not aware of them. Jens Kuhn, are you aware? Just let us know. I could go look it up on the site, but it takes a long time to get through the ICTV site, and we only have seven minutes. And uh, The next one is Brianne. All right. Agda writes, 
Hello, Vincent and team. Greetings from chilly Berlin, 15 Celsius. Everyone is talking about SARS-CoV-2 reinfection these days. The latest report includes multiple tests, serology, and specific testing for sample mix-up contamination, going even further than the HKU paper. Um, and she gives a link. Um, and I believe this is the one that is the pre-publication from Lancet, yep. or that has been submitted to Lancet. That's right. Um, at the same time, Shane Crotty, and I'm sure Christian Jostin will say the same, is convinced that very few people won't zero convert at all, which is reassuring. However, does it answer all the questions about the reinfection infection kinetics? Can we confidently say that reinfections are very rare exceptions to the rule? It would be great to hear from John Udell on the open questions about respiratory virus reinfections or from Marion Koopman, who's been involved in researching reinfections in the Netherlands, among many, many other things. Thanks a lot for all you do. We didn't ask him what he th thought about seroconversion, did he? Did we? Um, he mentioned sort of percents of people who were seropositive. It's pretty low in um, Germany, right? And they were pretty low. Yeah. Um, he did seem to think that reinfection, you know, might happen in one to five percent of cases. I believe is what he said. Yeah. Um, pretty rare. And that right now, what we're seeing is quite rare. Yeah. I think a lot of the our perspective on reinfection is based on the experience with the endogenous human coronaviruses, uh, and that reinfections are. Uh, I don't. I don't know whether to say that they're. I don't know that they're common, but, you know, it seems like relatively so. Not, I wouldn't necessarily call them rare, but inconsequential, really, because of what I uh, presume, what, what I perceive of as uh, partial residual immunity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, and so we don't, re it's too early to know what's going to happen with this, yeah, but I think our thinking is based on... Uh, that experience. Yeah, I kind of wonder about some of the data on the, the reinfection with the common coronaviruses, um, because I wonder how frequently they're we're testing and diagnosing potential reinfections. So there are two um, things. I can imagine, uh, you know, I don't tend to go get a lot of PCR done yeah. when I have a cold. So Jeff Shaman, who was on a long time ago, his lab has done a study on this and they followed a cohort in New York City and sampled them frequently and and found multiple reinfections with corona uh, common cold coronaviruses. Um I don't believe it's published but if you go to his lab website you can see it right there. And Right, I've forgotten about that. Right. I was looking at that the other day. Um it's quite interesting. I'm going to I'm going to um tell you about it right now. And then of course there's the paper Shane Crotty <laughs> Shane Crotty mentioned. Uh, which he says is what everyone uses to um, uh, say that uh, common cold coronas don't do long-lasting immunity. He sent that to me, so I will send it to you guys. Yeah, here we go. Do. So here is the Shaman paper. It's just a manuscript, actually, right? Uh, it is called Direct Observation of Repeated Infections with Endemic coronaviruses, Marta Galanti and Jeff Shaman. It's a manuscript. And during the study, 12 individuals. So this was a study in New York from fall 2016 to spring 2018. Weekly a nasal swab collection with self-reports of respiratory symptoms from 191 participants. During the study, 12 individuals tested positive multiple times for the same coronavirus. We found no significant difference between the probability of testing positive at least once and the probability of a recurrence for the coronas HKU1 and OC43 at 34 weeks after enrollment. We also found no significant association between repeat infections and symptom severity. The study provides evidence that reinfections with the same endemic coronavirus are not atypical in a time window shorter than one year. So okay. that's, that's important. Good. He didn't look yeah, at he important. didn't look at antibody responses, but nevertheless, it's important. Anyway, Marion Koopman, yes, I'm working on getting Marion on. It will happen at some point. All right, one more, Rich. Nancy writes, "Hi, Twiv. After the last episode, I thought about this article and book for Vincent and everyone. I don't know if I agree with all the conclusions, and there may be other good books on the subject." But this guy has been thinking about some of the problems Vincent is concerned about for a while. 
Uh, at the least, the history and psychology are interesting. The pandemic surf uh, surfaces how absurd people have become about uh, about their quote belief in science. Uh, but it's a real problem for all of us. I believe that the title says it all. Um, and it's Thomas, uh, Thomas Nichols, The Death of Expertise, The Campaign Against Established Knowledge and Why It Matters, and gives a link to this book and gives a link to an article uh, that uh, sort of summarizes it. Uh, this one came across the TWIV radar previously. I recognize it, and I've been meaning to read it. It sounds like it would be very illuminating. I have not. Yes, uh, I have not looked at this. Let's um, put it as a like a snippet on the top of another show. A okay. Previa that we can so we can discuss this in some detail. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll have to look at it then. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Um, but I want to read the book. I want to know why people are turning away from knowledge. What's the problem, folks? It's not and that what hard. what we can do about it. What can we do and about it? what we can do about it. What it's just, it? you know, uh, reasoning is hard. You know, it, it's this takes an effort. You know, the right? sign in my yeah. office, right? Remember the sign in my office? Do you uh, remember? What's it say? There is no expedient to which a man will not resort to avoid the real labor of thinking. Yeah. I love that. It's by Joshua Reynolds, and I bought it when I visited Thomas Edison's um, museum ages ago when I was a kid. I thought it was so cool. It's true. Thinking is hard, but it's rewarding, and it's not so bad. I mean, what's the alternative? To watch football all weekend? Oh, sorry. Yeah. I have some colleagues who do that. I don't get it. <laughs> I mean, I don't have anything against football, but to watch it all weekend, just spend an hour doing some hard thinking. And then the more you do it, the more you like it. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Obviously, so listen to Twiv, and we'll give you stuff to think about. But you could just listen to us if you don't want to think um, yeah. independently on your own, and we'll give you stuff to think about. Right. We don't have all the answers. We got a lot of questions. Okay, give you stuff to think about. We got a lot of questions for sure. All right, that's TWIV 659, microbe.tv slash TWIV. Questions and comments, go to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, you could support us financially. We'd love your support. We have many new supporters, and we are just so grateful to them. Um, and uh, you can join the crowd at microbe.tv slash contribute. That, that includes Patreon and PayPal, where you could give a little bit of money on a regular basis, or you could give a chunk of money if, if you want. Some people do that. Or you can go over to cafepress.com slash twiv and buy stuff like T-shirts and mugs and hats. I know that, that uh, Rich Condit has a twiv cap. I do. I have and, a twiv Brianne, hat. Brianne I have a couple has, of twiv T-shirts. Brianne has hoodies. I've got a couple of thingies. twiv mugs. I have a Twiv hoodie that is very comfortable. Yeah. I wore it earlier this week. Cool stuff. Did you do you have an immune thing? I think uh, I, my sister has the immune hoodie. Oh, you bought it for her, right? I did. It was, a, it was a birthday gift. Very nice. I, I yeah, that's right. I remember that. Okay. Uh, microbe.tv slash contribute. Brianne Barker is over at Drew University uh, here in New Jersey and on Twitter. She is Bioprof Barker. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Rich Condit's an emeritus professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. And Brianne, you're committed for Friday, dude. I'm in. I'm in. Good. Just have to leave at 3.30, right? Yeah, I have another thing at 3.30. That's no problem. Yeah, so because we got we'll, be sure, to be sure we don't yak too much at the top. Of the we'll <laughs> do the paper first up at the top. I have a couple of other interesting tidbits to do and then you can you can go no problem thank you appreciate it. i don't mean to cast any aspersions is it aspersions or dispersions aspersions on i think it's aspersions people's presence or not i know you have shit to i know you have things to do <laughs> <laughs> oh no i i would generally prefer to be at twiv than going to some of the meetings <laughs> I go to TWIV over any meeting whatsoever. I say I got a standing TWIV at 11 and 2 on Wednesday and Friday, and that's it. Nothing's going to interfere with it. Very little. Unless you're going to give me a billion dollars to support it, then I would consider it. But that would. I really fun. enjoyed the conversation with Christian. That was great. Yeah, Christian's a very smart guy. 
And yeah. uh, I, I, he, what did he say? He's a clinical, clinical virologist. virologist. Is what he calls himself. Interesting. Hmm. I, I, he should do TWIV once a month. Everyone should start writing him. Let's do a MENA uh, campaign on Drosten, right? Everybody write him and tell him to do once a month on TWIV. I, he doesn't have to. He doesn't want to, obviously, but. No, he's, he, he wants to get back to A work. lot of people would like to hear him. Well, I think TWIV is is good stuff. It's important to communicate. Did uh, Christian spend time in the States? I don't recall his history. <sighs> Because his English is impeccable. We um, th we did discuss his history. You should listen to the first ten minutes of his first episode. Yeah, I'll uh, do that. Where he talks about, you know, he was one of the first people to identify SARS, the original SARS that flew into Germany, and um, he said he took a flask of infected cells and went somewhere with it and he said I, sh I, I won't be arrested now for this because it's too long ago but I shouldn't have done it <laughs> it's very funny I'm Vincent Racaniello you can find me at virology.blog I'd like to thank ASV the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music this episode of TWIV was recorded edited and posted by me Vincent Racaniello You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>